coming back to Florida from New York this fall, we decided to take a detour off of Interstate 95 and go down the Blue Ridge Parkway. We missed the peak fall colors by about a week, but boy, it was still a beautiful trip and one that we will certainly take again. Our trip began at the Afton Mountain Bed and Breakfast. It's a great place to stop on your way to the parkway, just a few miles from the entrance, and the accommodations were just wonderful. That evening, we had dinner at the Blue Mountain Brewery. I can't recommend it enough. It was a wonderful evening and the views were just spectacular. We had a great night's sleep at the bed and breakfast and we relaxed for a few minutes before we began our drive. The Blue Ridge Parkway is the most visited unit of the entire National Park Service. The parkway runs 469 miles from Virginia to North Carolina. It was constructed during the depression of the 1930s to connect the Shenandoah National Park to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The entire Blue Ridge area provides an unparalleled diversity of experiences. There's so much to see and do that no two visits here are ever the same. Nature lovers will find majestic mountain vistas and scenic drives, outstanding hiking, biking, and equestrian trails, world-class whitewater and waterfalls, excellent campgrounds and fishing streams, an incredible diversity of plant and animal life in a region of abundant, protected forest and parks. After leaving Rockfish Gap, we stopped at milepost 5.8. We wanted to check out the Humpback Rock Visitor Center and Outdoor Farm Museum. It's small in relationship to the other visitor center along the parkway, but it does have some very good facilities. We were able to pick up a lot of valuable information about the parkway at the visitor center. Time did not allow us to hike all the way down to Humpback Rock. It's a very steep one mile hike to the rock itself and usually takes about 45 minutes. And with the time that you'd want to spend taking in the vistas, we just did not feel like it was something that we could do this time. We would just have to save that hike for our next time here. We spent the time that we had strolling around the paths of the Farm Museum and checking out the entire exhibit. Wandering around the exhibit, you get a much deeper appreciation for the difficulties that must have been associated with farming these areas during the late 1800s and early 1900s. There's a single room log cabin and a series of outbuildings that represent the elements of regional architecture of the late 19th century. Having grown up in West Virginia, I truly appreciated the fact that these were the type of structures that my great-grandparents once lived in. Everything there was so very rustic. Modern conveniences that we take advantage of today were things that weren't even thought of living here in the mountains. This all gives you such a great appreciation of how strong these people must have been and how difficult their lives were in relationship to how we live today. It was a beautiful and simple way of life. As you look around, you realize that everything here was produced by hand. It was all made of things that occur naturally on this land and was built by the people that lived here. Craftsmanship and the attention to detail is really amazing. 
and the National Park Service has gone to great extent to make sure that everything is so well preserved. Well, we spent a lot more time here than I really thought we would. And we're only six miles into the journey. So we need to get back to the car, get back on the road, and see what else we can see along the way. We're now at the Greenstone Trail Overlook, milepost 8.8. .8. This is about four or five miles further than Susan actually thought that I'd be able to make it on the parkway. You see, the parkway is two lanes all the way along from Virginia to the end in North Carolina. The speed limit, the maximum speed limit, is 45 miles an hour. And she just didn't think that it would be possible for me to be able to drive that that long at that speed. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't sure whether I could do it myself. But I found the drive to be very relaxing and it was really interesting to be able to take in all of the natural beauty and the 45 miles an hour didn't tend to bother me at all. A trip on the parkway is the exact opposite of what we experience in our hectic daily lives. The slow and relaxed parkway provides sunshine, mountain gust, and up-close views of the Blue Ridge region. You drive along the crest of the world's oldest mountain range as you wind through the coves and forest slopes of southern Appalachia. The breathtaking views stamp an unforgettable impression in your mind. It's been said the too many places we see in America today look like too many places we see in America today. Interstates, cities, subdivisions can all look alike no matter where you are. But America's national parks are unique with remarkable experiences and unobtainable anywhere else. That's what you find here on the Blue Ridge Parkway. The landscape along the Virginia portion of the parkway differs from those in North Carolina. There are many historical areas right off the parkway in Virginia. And in North Carolina, the mountain ranges tend to be about a thousand feet higher than what you find in Virginia. Blue Ridge Parkway was born at a time in American history when social change was at the forefront of political events. The idea resulted from a combination of many factors, the primary one being that jobs were needed. Trained engineers, architects, and landscape architects were left unemployed by the Great Depression, and thousands of mountain families were on the verge of poverty. The recent opening of two eastern parks, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and the Shenandoah National Park, were attracting tourists to the naturally beautiful but financially poor area. And the increasing availability of automobiles foresaw a new generation of motoring vacations. The construction of the Blue Ridge Parkway didn't begin until late in 1935. Although the plan had been in the works for two years prior, at that time, President Franklin D. Roosevelt had visited the construction site along the Skyline Drive through the Shenandoah National Park. Liking what he saw, he soon approved the concept of constructing a scenic motorway linking the two parks, Shenandoah and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. There was a great deal of negotiation between the White House and Congress over the acquisition, funding, and location of the road. It was decided that the parkway would follow the crest of the Southern Appalachian Mountains through Virginia and North Carolina, and that the necessary right-of-ways should be purchased by the states and then turned over to the federal government to be administered by the National Park Service as part of the parks. The parkway differs from usual national parks in its narrow land holdings. At times, it shrinks to widths of only 200 feet. Progress on the parkway was slow in the beginning. Crews surveyed into the mountains and realized the enormity of the task at hand. No maps, reluctant landholders, and extreme weather conditions. 
Many of the mountain roads that existed at that time were little more than ruts and could not even accommodate the equipment needed for construction. The designers of the road wanted it to remain as natural as possible and create as little scar as possible to the natural surroundings. A great deal of care was taken to design and build a roadway so it blended into nature. Progress on the parkway was slow but steady until World War II. Funds for the parkway had to be diverted to the war effort. After the war, through the 1950s and 60s, there was a slowing of construction until, by 1968, the only task left was the completion of the seven-mile stretch around North Carolina's Grandfather Mountain. By far, my favorite visitor center along the parkway is the Blue Ridge Music Center. It celebrates the music and musicians of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's located near Galax, Virginia, the birthplace of country music. Each spring, visitors come to enjoy some of the region's finest traditional music, including bluegrass, old-time folk, and country and blues. The grounds are home to an outdoor amphitheater and an indoor theater that features a museum and a gift shop. The museum features the roots of American music, an interactive exhibit highlighting the historical significance of the region's music. Through the stories of local artists, you hear how the history of Blue Ridge Mountain music reaches back for generations, starting from musical forms in Europe and West Africa. The exhibit traces how traditional music continues to influence folk, rock, and popular music made today. The center was really a highlight of the trip for me. I wish that we could have stayed longer, the Daily Bluegrass show didn't start until about two hours after we had already arrived, so we really couldn't hang around that long. I look forward to coming back and enjoying some really good music the next time. Back on the parkway, we cross over from Virginia and into North Carolina and begin the last leg of our trip, which will end around Asheville, North Carolina. Traveling along the parkway, you go through 26 tunnels that were blasted through the mountain ridges, with dozens of bridges needed to make the rivers and creeks passable. There are more than 200 parking areas, overlooks, and developed areas that were incorporated into the design so that motorists could enjoy and leisurely drive through the mountains. The road itself ascends to more than 6,000 feet at Richland Balsam Overlook in North Carolina and descends to just over 600 feet at the James River in Virginia. Hundreds of easements and agricultural use permits were negotiated with the parkway neighbors to ensure there was no intrusion to nature. Our final visitor stop was at the Brineguard Cabin at milepost 238 near Laurel Springs, North Carolina. Martin Brinegar and his wife, Caroline, built the cabin during the 1880s. Martin was a cobbler. He got cash by selling his shoes for about a dollar a pair, depending on how large your foot was. And Caroline was a weaver on a loom that she received as a wedding present from her father. The Brinegar cabin shows us the resourcefulness of mountain people and the development of the cottage industries in which people were able to obtain cash for the items that they made at home. Though Martin died in 1925, Caroline continued to live there until 1935, when the homestead was purchased by the Parkway. The cabin and outbuildings are typical of the way that mountain families lived during that period. Brine guards cleared the land, raised crops, and their poultry and livestock roamed free in the mountains. Our adventure down the Blue Ridge Parkway was truly amazing. It took us two days to travel 390 miles from Afton, Virginia to where we exited the parkway at Asheville, North Carolina. 
time and logistics did not allow us to take the last 70 miles of the parkway into the Great Smoky Mountains. But we sure look forward to coming back again, hopefully next year, and do the entire trip. I was surprised, but you really do need more than two days to take in everything that the parkway has to offer. Next year, I think we'll start in North Carolina in the Smokies and work our way up into Virginia. But for now, it was a great trip and a wonderful adventure for both of us. We can't wait to get back and see it again. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please hit the like button. If you want to see more of the adventures of Susan and Rich, then please subscribe. Leave us a comment. Stay safe. Have a great day and please stop by again very soon.